Good afternoon, it's Ann Simnecki again, and I am here to introduce Dr. Michael Lim. Dr. Lim is currently the professor and chair of neurosurgery at Stanford University School of Medicine, and he is sitting in 70 degree weather while I am in New Jersey in nine degree weather. So I wish we were doing this in person in California. Um, he's going to talk about case studies. So please remember to type your questions into the chat and at about 2.10, I will ask as many questions as we can get to, if not sooner. So we'll see how many questions we have and how long the presentation takes. So take it away, Dr. Lim. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Semenecki. So um, first of all, I uh, recently moved out here to California about a year ago, but I, I lived in the East Coast for many years and my heart goes out to you for um, uh, the winter storm that's out there and hope all of you are safe. Um, I know it's for the kids, they usually love it, but I know it's it's uh, probably a major inconvenience for you. So um, I, I just want to thank, say it's an honor and privilege to be here. Um, there are some patients I probably have known and have had the privilege of taking care of over the years, and thank you for coming in. Um, but uh, today I thought we could talk a little bit about, you know, trying to choose the right procedures for trigeminal neuralgia. And, um, I'm gonna, these are my relevant disclosures. Um, but what I think, the, the way I structured my talk, um, I divided into kind of cases. We'll talk about a specific scenario and uh, talk about the treatment options so that hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll kind of understand why um, some of us recommend the treatments that we do. So this was an interesting article that my resident uh, forwarded me the other day and uh, it was an article in Cell, and they had shown a picture of a trigeminal ganglion of an elephant. Okay, and you can see that in slide A here. Um, but just to give you an idea of how big that uh, ganglion is for the trigeminal nerve in an elephant, to the right is a spinal cord. Um, and uh, that's the spinal cord of, um, uh, I mean, that's the size of the spinal cord. But can you just imagine how much bigger that trigeminal ganglion is? And, and it is such an important part and aspect of, of uh, an elephant's life in terms of having sensory um, input from the world and being able to process it. So one of the things that I think uh, Dr. Zimmerman talked about yesterday was imaging. And uh, there's a lot of words that are out there, fiesta, they call them vibe, true fist, but there's a lot uh, of questions on, on imaging, and I get a lot of patients who come to my clinic uh, saying, I have a vessel in my nerve, I have trigeminal neuralgia. But most of the time, uh, or actually for all our patients, first of all, imaging is uh, to rule out other causes of pain. You know, for example, I've had patients who had a small, tiny meningioma, which is a benign brain tumor that was pressing on the, on the nerve, that uh, was picked up with imaging, or a bigger tumor, or uh, patients, for example, had an inflammatory condition. And then once you, they get that scan, sometimes they don't get the high resolution scan, and we have them go back and get these high resolution scans. And at that point, the imaging is really help. It really helps in uh, choosing a procedure. And uh, for example, this is uh, one of those high resolution scans. If you can look here i don't know if you can see my mouse but uh, i can on my screen there's a um, this is the right trigeminal nerve and you can see a little swoosh here and uh, in that case that was a, a vessel that was compressing the nerve which uh, had implications for the uh, treatment um, options i was going to uh, recommend to the patient so when you go uh, and and are seeking treatment for trigeminal neuralgia the goals need to be clearly stated out, right? First of all, um, sometimes uh, the path in identifying the cause of the pain and addressing the pain uh, may uh, end up with two separate journeys. And um, as you know, trigeminal neuralgia, as we've spoken about, is a clinical diagnosis, um, which means there's no blood test, for example, that we can do to say, aha, you have that diagnosis for sure. And so sometimes patients come without a blood vessel on the nerve and uh, have the classic symptoms of trigeminal neuralgia. And, and really the goals at that point are to try to get 
uh, pain control and try to address the sharp seven pain. And oftentimes we make it also very clear that uh, pain comes in many different, or it comes, a, comes in many different um, characteristics. And um, the sharp stabbing pain uh, or electrical pain is usually what we're trying to address uh, in the world of trigeminal neuralgia. Usually when patients present with facial pain for the first time, medical therapies are very, uh, have high rates of efficacy. About 70% of the patients will respond to medications and, and do well. And these are a couple of them, Tegretol, Baclofen, Neurontin, Amitriptyline, Dilantin. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of patients uh, go on this and, and can do well, but sometimes over time, the pain uh, breaks through or uh, patients need to have, uh, get or need double agents or increasing levels of, of a set agent. And as a result, some of the common side effects that I've seen in my patients are that they say they're, they're unsteady. One of the things I'll do in my uh, clinic when I see those patients is I'll have them do something called a tandem gait. You know, it's, it's basically uh, what the police officers do to test if you're drunk, have you walk in a straight line or they call walk in a tightrope. A lot of my patients who are on high levels, these meds are very, very unsteady. Others say that they feel mentally slowed and they're, they're not able to perform at the level that they want. So when the medications fail you, uh, there are good surgical options. And I usually tell my patients, you're choosing between good, good, and good. And uh, those ther uh, treatments are kind of broken into three categories, the rhizotomies, the radiosurgery, and the microvascular decompressions, okay? So let's, let's take some scenarios. So for example, this is a, a, a 78 year old female to, to my clinic with five years of sharp stabbing pain that uh, increased in intensity on the right side of her face. The pain she said was predominantly in B3, a little bit in B2. And her pain was triggered by eating, drinking, and cold wind. And uh, as, as I mentioned before, she was a very classic case where she was starting to need really high doses of medications. I want to say something like 2,700 uh, milligrams of, of Neurontin, which is pretty high. And so she was seeking uh, some surgical options because uh, she did not want to continue on the medications and quality of life was, again, very impaired. Her past medical history uh, was notable for the fact that she had multiple TIAs. TIAs are what they call transient ischemic attacks, which are small mini strokes. Um, and uh, she has had a history of um, atrial fibrillation and she was on blood thinners. And so, you know, as we started talking about her surgical options, there was the rhizotomy, the radiosurgery and the microvascular decompressions. And again, all options are, are good, good and good. But in her situation, because of her past medical history, she was probably at a higher risk of going under longer risks, I mean, long-term uh, anesthesia. And so for her, the, the options were um, probably, her best initial options were rhizotomy and stereotactic radio surgery. And I wanna make it clear, I have had patients who um, wanted to get a microvascular decompression in the setting of cardiac history and uh, any of these procedures uh, involves us working very closely with the cardiologist, um, but we have found ways to make it work. So when you hear about rhizotomies, what are rhizotomies? And this is a picture, there's a very nice picture on the Mayfield Institute website. And the point of it is what you're trying to do is you're taking a needle and you're poking it just to the side of the uh, lip. And it's about an inch to the side of the lip. And what you do is you pass it and you thread it up using fluoroscopy, x-rays. And you put it through a little hole in the bottom of the skull, we call foramen ovale. And you literally put the needle right at the ganglion where the nerve branches into the three major branches. It's basically the top of the tree trunk. And at that point, you can treat it. And, and essentially you're doing an ablative procedure. Ablative means you're essentially injuring the nerve uh, to essentially stop some of this electrical firing. And so one of the first things that people uh, did to injure the nerve is to use glycerin. Now, the backstory behind this was that Lars Excel, the gentleman who invented the gamma knife, used, uh, was trying to actually treat patients with trigeminal neuralgia with radiation. 
And so in order to do that back in the 50s and 60s, you had to have some sort of contrast agent so that he knew where to direct the radiation. And most of these contrast agents were metal or some sort of metal. And if you try to mix metal with water, we all know that the metal sediments out to the bottom and it's not really a, a great carrier. So he looked on the shelf and found glycerol and uh, then mixed the glycerol with the tantalum powder and injected it up into that area that I showed earlier. What was interesting though, was that a lot of those patients reported pain relief um, before they ever got the radiation and that's how glycerol uh, came to be. Now it's interesting, glycerol works by what they call colligative properties. If you remember back to high school chemistry, basically glycerol is a super thick viscous substance. And what it does is it wicks the water out of the out of the myelin, which is the is essentially the um, the uh, insulation fibers of the nerve, and uh, as it does that, it stops the nerves from firing. The early studies by Dr. Hawkinson, uh, they he had done about 100 patients, showed that this was really effective. They they had said 95% uh, relief. Um, however, uh, a lot of these patients had recurrence. Uh, more than half, though, did get some numbness. Um, these rhizotomies are, have some nuances to them, and there are some technical aspects of it that uh, predict the success rates of these, um, this procedure. But in general, most people across the country would say there's about an 80 to 90% chance of relief. And uh, there is some numbness associated with it, but uh, this generally does uh, recur. As a side note, when patients get these types of rhizotomies, they do have to come off the anticoagulation and this uh, particular person had to come off the anticoagulation, uh, usually about a week before or depending on some of the other drugs, like for example, Eliquis, I believe is three days before. And uh, in my practice, I usually let the patients start back on the you know, blood thinners the day after the procedure. So again, it's a very short window that they need to come off the blood thinners, which is why Again, for people with cardiac history, uh, this could be highly effective. The other thing is it's the relief is almost immediate. Radiofrequency rhizotomy is, is a variation on a theme. Uh, it's the same idea. You pass the needle up into the same hole, you put it in the same place. But instead of using a chemical called glycerol, you use heat and you burn the nerve. And there's nuances it's because there's many different temperatures you can burn the nerve at. Uh, the rates of numbness are higher and uh, the recurrence rates, again, are very similar to the glycerin. In general, with the radiofrequency rhizotomies, a lot of us wake the patients up during the middle of the procedure because we map the nerve, because we want the needle to lie right on the spot where you're having the pain, and then we put you back to sleep and burn the nerve. With these rhizotomies, because I told you that they uh, recur, the, the uh, to extrapolate from that, the patients then get multiple procedures. And, you know, these, these are our series from Hopkins, uh, when I was at Johns Hopkins. And um, you can see that uh, we've done a lot of the glycerin and the radiofrequency rhizotomies. But, you know, you can see over the years that patients have had multiple procedures over, over time. It also, when we started looking back at our numbers, um, having a glycerin rhizotomy and, and success with the glycerol rhizotomy, you can actually have success uh, have with subsequent rhizotomies and, and patients can do well. So in this situation, uh, the, um, this patient chose to do a rhizotomy and did well. Um, I'll talk about the radiosurgery in a second here. So the, this is the second case. In this second case, this was a, a, a younger female, 52 years old, who presented with eight years of progressive right-sided um, pain, again, triggered by brushing her teeth. Uh, this person had tried multiple medications and uh, was not, uh, and her quality of life was affected by the side effects. Past medical history, she was uh, very healthy, was on no medications, had no uh, prior surgeries. And uh, she, when she came to my clinic, uh, the neurologist had ordered an MRI and the imaging, uh, in fact, the imaging that I showed you earlier was that person's imaging uh, showed a compression of her trigeminal nerve. Now, in terms of the surgical options for this patient, um, we always discuss all three options, but uh, this patient was a candidate for all three. 
Um, however, uh, for younger patients uh, who can undergo surgery or patients who are, uh, I call physiologically young, uh, they can, the, a lot of us recommend microvascular decompressions in this setting. And this is the article that Dr. Brown was just referencing earlier. This was uh, Dr. Janetta's series. Uh, he had operated on uh, 1,185 patients and it was a very nice prospective study over uh, 20 years. And uh, he had shown that uh, there was high rates of success. So I was just gonna show, for example, um, some intro video of of a microvascular compression. Apologies. So, uh, Dr. Brown mentioned earlier, these are the high resolution scans. We try to look at the patient's uh, nerve and the relationship of the vessel to the nerve in, in multiple, uh, multiple views. Uh, this person had a vessel that's touching the nerve. And so what we do is, um, I like to use imaging because I like to uh, mark out the, the signal transfer sinus, but this is um, usually a very classic incision behind the ear. We mark out where it's called the sigma transverse sinus, and uh, we uh, make an opening right here behind the ear. Then we expose the bone. And uh, again, I like to use the imaging to just map out um, what they call sigmoid transverse sinus. It's a big vein. And it, with that, you can then make a very small opening uh, in the skull. And once you make that opening and you remove the bone uh, using these drills, you can actually be able to expose the dura underneath. The dura is the covering to the brain. Again, with the small opening, you can then open the dura and um, you can visualize the, the brain, the cerebellum underneath. I, use, I like to use a little piece of um, cotton, it's called cottonoid, and you can just gently um, pull, pull down on the brain. And um, this is a cottonoid. I usually put a little, um, they call it Ioban, uh, just so that it slides on the brain and you can uh, then keep the brain nice and pristine. We then uh, drain CSF, uh, it's the cerebral spinal fluid. Once you drain that fluid, uh, you can actually get the brain to relax very nicely. So you just open up that area. Okay. Once we uh, opened up the dura, you can see that the, with the CSF drain, the brain's actually pulsating very nicely, but you can see right in front of the cerebellum. And uh, these instruments, just to give you some reference, are about a, a millimeter or two in width. Um, we can uh, very gently go down and, and just uh, go right down to the, the trigeminal nerve here, just in the interest of time. So what we do is then we start uh, removing what they call arachnoid layers. Uh, it's just normal membranes that help us form little compartments. And uh, just gonna move forward a little bit. You can see the blood vessel that's, that was touching the nerve there and we pushed it off. Once you uh, push the, the blood vessel off the nerve, And, and cut the uh, connections, you can sometimes really be able to pull that vessel off. And then this is the, the cushions that we talk about, the Teflon cushions, and you can literally uh, put them through. Uh, I think you've heard of various techniques uh, probably throughout the meeting. Some people like to use glues, some people sling them. Um, and so for each patient, there's, uh, there's a, we often try to personalize what, what might be best to keeping the the nerve. Oh, I'm sorry. So um, after we finish, you can see that the brain looks nice and pristine underneath. We just close the dura. And uh, even though we close the dura nice and tightly, that fluid, the CSF leak could, could happen at this point. And so sometimes what we do is we put uh, what they call fibrin glue um, or in this case, we put uh, a bone cement and you can 
literally just push that into the uh, air, can air canal. I usually um, kind of seal it in there with, a, with, a, with my finger a little bit, and then we fill this uh, defect up with this bone cement, and then it's nice and smooth. So, you know, for example, this is the microvascular decompression. You can see the vessel touching the nerve here. Um, we're able to separate the nerve again. If this is a different configuration, because this is the lupus superior cerebellar artery. And if I'm back to Genetta series, and we all agree, most of the case, most of the time, there's something called the superior cerebellar artery that was compressing the nerve. And, uh, but there often, there can be, for example, uh, other arteries and even a vein that's touching the nerve. As I mentioned before, some of the more con common complications are the CSF leaks. People, a small number of patients have lost some hearing from that, and uh, some people have had some double vision. But overall, it's actually a very safe operation. And if you look at the outcomes from 20 years, about 70% of these patients, who so the patients who receive this are essentially cured. And in the uh, case of a reoperation for repeat MBD, you go uh, closer down to 55% versus 70%. But again, you can get some really nice long-term relief. Uh, the predictors for success, most people um, should have pretty uh, immediate or uh, immediate pain relief. And then some people, if they don't, that's sometimes a poor predictor of success. But in my experience, you could, I've had, sometimes you've had to wait to, to the, uh, six, a couple weeks after the surgery. But as I mentioned before, this is a, one of those surgeries where you're not trying to ablate something. You're basically just trying to address the problem of the vessel touching the nerve. And as a result, you can essentially obtain a cure for these patients. Now, often, sometimes I get asked, well, what, do you, what happens if you go in there and you really don't see a blood vessel touching the nerve? And this is something that many of us talk about in the country and we share um, pearls and tips. This was something that uh, for example, I was talking with some of my colleagues uh, at, at UPenn uh, with, and um, we're, we wrote up a series on this. And what we do is, as I mentioned, the glycerin before, instead of injecting the glycerin up, up here in the operation, what we can do is we can actually inject some of the glycerin. You can see that it's a, a, this clear substance, and we literally just put it into a nerve and, and inject some of the glycerin. And uh, we've had very good uh, success with that. Some of my patients are actually, you know, seven to eight years out uh, without pain uh, using this procedure. Uh, the other procedure that um, people have talked about is they call combing the nerve or neurolysis. Um, rather than cutting the nerve itself, the nerves are made up of multiple fibers. And what you can do is you can just split these nerve fibers. And when you do that, um, I've been... Dr. Evans does a lot of this at Jefferson, for example, and I've been doing some of these. This works out really well, but I do wait. Some of my patients wake up with numbness for this. But these are some of the things that we try to employ, you know, having a, um, you know, option B uh, going in for, for an MDD. What Sometimes when I'm in my clinics, uh, my patients say, well, gosh, you know, I'd love to do a rhizotomy first because not because the MVD means I'm in the hospital one day, I'm gonna need a few weeks to recover, whereas the rhizotomy, you just wake up with the Band-Aid. And uh, we look back at our series, and it turns out that uh, if you do the MVD first uh, versus uh, second, the success rates do change a bit, um, but overall, you can actually still do very well if you still wanna wait. But in general, it seems that if you, um, do the rhizotomy first, we've noticed that uh, chances of success have gone down a little bit. This uh, third case is a 83-year-old gentleman who presented with uh, 15 years of uh, left side of pain. Again, fa uh, failed multiple therapies. This person had uh, an extensive cardiac history and his cardiologist said, <laughs> Ganko under uh, general anesthesia cannot come off their anticoagulation. And uh, every time they have, they've had deep venous thromboses and they've even have what's called a pulmonary emboli, which is a clot that went to the lung. So in this gentleman's situation, there was really only one option for them, and that was stereotactic radiosurgery. The concept of radiosurgery is that you're trying to deliver a high dose of radiation right to the trigeminal nerve. The idea is that you shoot multiple beams of radiation that are very low in energy, 
energy and they crisscross right on top of the nerve. This is a gamma knife, this is the cyber knife. These are some of the more common tools that are used. When we do that, you can have very high precision and you can actually directly um, put the radiation onto the nerves and people do well. As I mentioned before, Dr. Excel did this in 1951. When he did find patients that could respond, uh, that, he, that were adequate candidates, he found 50% success. In the mid 90s at, at University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Kanzioka published a large series and they showed that actually they were able to get pretty good uh, or excellent pain relief in 63, almost two thirds of the patients and uh, reported that the numbness rate was only 10%. However, again, this was not a durable therapy and a lot of patients will end up having pain that's recurred. Uh, just in the interest of time, there are nuances to this procedure. And again, you want somebody who's done a good number of them. The dose, um, the length of the nerve treated, and exactly where you put that spot of radiation along the nerve. Remember, the nerve is like a tree trunk. Whether you put it at the top of the tree trunk, middle of the tree trunk, or, or at the bottom of the tree trunk does seem to make a difference. And in the interest of time, I'm going to just kind of highlight this. But uh, the doses of radiation are very, very high. So these machines are extremely precise. But, you know, 70 grays of radiation, just to give you perspective, a person presents with a, an acoustic neuroma or, or other benign tumors, we're giving 15 gray to 20 gray radiation to get the nerve to essentially to knock out the nerve. Um, in essence, we've also learned that if you treat a longer length of the nerve, you can have more complications with burning pain and or chewing weakness and bad numbness. And as I mentioned before, the nerve is like a tree trunk before it splits out. Uh, where you put it uh, along this nerve seems to make a difference. And uh, again, those are some nuances. As I mentioned before, the, these procedures are not without some risk, uh, especially the rhizotomies and the radiation have a risk of causing anesthesia dolorosa. It's basically painful numbness. Uh, patients feel burning pain in the setting of numb faces. Uh, they can have uh, problems with chewing. And uh, if the radiation is not... Uh, can, can be a little bit off. People can actually even have some neurologic deficits. Again, these are all very safe, but uh, these things can happen. And I think it's very important. And I spend a lot of time counseling my patients about these things um, because if they happen, it's, it's, it's a, a really, it can really affect someone's quality of life. I'm going to just skip this. <clears throat> In terms of, you know, as we talk about medical costs, it turns out that the microvascular decompressions and the radiosurgery are, are a bit more expensive than the, the rhizotomies. But if you think about the MDD, the microvascular decompression, even though it's a little bit more expensive, if it's a durable treatment, i.e. a cure, uh, overall, it can be um, a better benefit for uh, society. So, you know, in general, this is kind of the mantra that most of us have used. A young, healthy patient gets an MDD. Uh, an older patient with high comorbidities can get... Um, usually a rhizotomy or SRS, but there are always exceptions. And, you know, I had a 90-year-old patient who looked like they were in their 50s and was highly uh, active in their life. And at that point, they wanted to consider an MBD, and we had a discussion about that. Um, so in summary, again, all these treatments are good, good, and good. It's just <clears throat> there's nuances to it, right? But most of the times it is... Uh, some issues with either numbness and chewing weakness. The right, these ablative procedures have higher rates of that uh, versus the microvascular decompression, but you trade off durability uh, for that. <clears throat> this is another case of a 62-year-old female who presented with uh, constant burning pain on her right side and had no triggers, no, no other past medical history. And this is a patient who has atypical trigeminal neuralgia. And you know, I was doing this literature search and as I was looking through the literature, some of the literature had suggested that rhizotomies and or MVDs have 60% success rates. I just haven't seen that as much. And so I always say, you, I always caution people. And I think it's important that you see someone who's taking care of a lot of them and have a very frank conversation again of, of your goals. Um, there are There is literature that suggests that sometimes a microvascular decompression or a rhizotomy can work, but Again, this is something where I have a very long conversation with my patients. I'm not as optimistic for, for those procedures for the atypical facial pain. And then uh, this is another case of, uh, I have seen a good number of patients. We have all seen a good number of patients who present with both what we call typical and atypical pain. You know, they have sharp stabbing pain uh, along with some 
uh, burning pain. And it's a spectrum. And so I usually try to ask my patients, if I could take away the sharp stabbing pain only, and you're left with that constant pain or aching pain or burning pain, if your quality of life is better, would you, um, I, if they say yes, that um, that would help them with their quality of life, I have offered uh, microvascular decompressions. Uh, we published our series on that of, of 74 patients who met that criteria. And in that, sit, in that setting, um, our numbers are not that far off from what Dr. Janetis uh, said, uh, showed. And essentially, um, about 70% 70, 70 of our patients actually were very happy with the results. Their sharp stabbing pain was addressed, um, even though uh, their atypical pain wasn't. Interestingly enough, we had a subset of patients whose atypical pain disappeared. Um, and I would say as, as we've had more follow-up, it's about six months before a good number of those people who had the atypical pain had their pain recur. But again, this is a, a situation where we don't really know the cause of the pain, but we're trying to help uh, someone with the quality of life. Um, I often get patients with multiple sclerosis and uh, at Hopkins, we had a pretty large series of patients uh, with uh, multiple sclerosis. And we've been treating those patients uh, during my time when I was at Hopkins and now at Stanford. I, I usually offer rhizotomies for those patients. Uh, we've had a mixture of glycerol and radiofrequency rhizotomies. But um, it, in general, about two thirds of the patients with MS actually have had good long term relief uh, with these rhizotomies, both with the radiofrequency and uh, the glycerin rhizotomies. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the um, situation where uh, patients, as we mentioned, they get MRIs, and it's not always just for blood vessels touching the nerve. This was an older gentleman who presented who actually had something called an epidermoid cyst. And I apologize, I couldn't get the quality picture that I wanted, but this is an epidermoid cyst. It's basically a, a cyst um, of what they call keratin. It's not technically a tumor, but this is the fifth nerve here, and it was pressing on the fifth nerve. And this patient presented with classic right-sided sharp stabbing pain, eating, drinking, and cold wind. And I really wish I could show you this picture, but but this stuff was a tumor. It's the, it only lights up in, in what they call um, diffusion, but we were able to get um, all of it out and decompress his nerve. And that person did really well. He was happy. His pain was gone. And uh, we addressed the problem. Um, I also get patients who have large tumors or are older and can't get these tumors removed. And in that setting, I've also done rhizotomies for these patients. Uh, I like doing glycerin rhizotomies. I find that the glycerin actually sits a little longer. It doesn't drain out because the tumors don't let the, the fluid drain out of Meckel's cave is easier. And I've had really great results. This is an example of a, a, an older patient who had a tumor up here pressing on the fifth nerve. You can see the fifth nerve here. And uh, um, you can see these are multiple types of tumors that, that were um, there. Um, in this case, if some of those patients, we were able to actually remove the tumors. And if I was able to do a subtotal resection, I was, we made sure to clear the tumor around the nerve. And um, a lot of those patients did well. So this was a, a, a this figure, I apologize that the title's not there, was basically showing that if you do a rhizotomy for these patients, you can actually get very nice uh, relief uh, in the pain and patients have done well. So, you know, as we mentioned before, one I wanted to put in um, one comment about, um, as what Dr. Brown said, you want to have a program and you want to in addition to offering um, the, the latest therapies, we also want to try to do research and do better for you, uh, for our patients. And so, you know, we always try um, to, for example, collect the CSF and blood from our patients, uh, especially during, we're doing this now at Stanford and we're doing it at Hopkins. And for example, we did some work on, on 200 patients where we uh, took uh, blood from the uh, NCSF from our patients um, it's unfortunately embargoed if it gets accepted, I'll be able to share the data with you next year, but we discovered a new receptor uh, for pain and we're very excited because we think it's gonna be a new target. Um, we've also been running uh, clinical trials and we have something called the calcitonin gene related peptide. Somebody had mentioned that I saw in the chats and uh, we're running this trial for, for patients because um, there is a lot of the CGRP actually in the trigeminal ganglion. And so uh, with Biohaven, which I just closed uh, a consultant for, but we designed a trial uh, to recruit 90 patients in a one-to-one -one randomization um, of the, the drug versus placebo. 
And uh, again, this is in adults. Because a lot of patients always worry that they're going to get the placebo, uh, this trial design was set up so that um, when you start on the trial, half of you can get the placebo, half of the patients will get the drug. But after a certain amount of time, you stop the drug, you get a washout, and then you flip. So you're insured to get the drug. You just don't know if you're going to get it first or second. And we're doing this for both typical and atypical patients. So I also want to acknowledge that I get to work with a great group of people. This is my the group of neurosurgeons I work with at, at Stanford. Uh, Steve Chang is a, a, a wonderful partner of mine, and, uh, and he and I really um, partnered together for the Trigeminal Neurology Center at, at Stanford. And uh, we work with great radiation oncologists and our clinical trials uh, folks, Anthony Bett and Maria Coburn. Uh, we also want to acknowledge that, again, I presented some data. I've had some wonderful students and residents that I've worked with over the years, as well as my colleagues from uh, Hopkins. Uh, so I want to say thank you for your for your time and happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. I'm going to start with a question of my own regarding clinical trials. So when you do a drug trial, like the one you just described, where you've got a washout period and they switch, do they take their regular meds in addition to the drug, the drug you're testing, or do you take them off of all of their meds? We try to get patients off their meds if we can. Okay. And do IRBs allow that? Yeah. I, I mean, it's a drug trial, and we try not to add risk to patients. So um, okay. actually, wait, wait, I take that back. This is a different trial. So we, you, have to be, you can be on your drug, but you have to be on a stable regimen of it. Okay. For a certain amount of time. So that way we can know whether or not this drug had a positive effect. Or okay. Negative effect. That's what I was thinking because I reviewed another study where they were taking people off drugs completely and it just really scared me. Okay. So we have another question. This I've never heard of. Are you familiar with photobiomodulation? I am not. Okay. Um, okay. The person who asked that question, maybe you can tell us a little more and we get some more information for you. There's a lot of interesting things out there where, you know, I, I, it's not because I don't believe in them or, but there's a lot of, uh, I think a lot of great work and a lot of great research. Uh, I mean, I've seen patients getting Botox. I've seen people getting um, wellness therapy. I've seen people getting acupuncture and in so, so, certain settings they have been effective. So. Well, I always say there's no magic bullet. So you have mm -hmm. to use a lot of things together to beat this. Right. And I've, I've since started talking about Swiss cheese. So you have to cover up all the holes by doing layers and layers of intervention. Anyway, um, I did I all... see that you said that Tegretol causes leukemia? So um, so any, so any medications, <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I always say, when you watch any medication on, on TV, they spend almost half the commercial talking about all the bad side effects. And mm -hmm. I think that there's been some reports of, of bad things like that happening or wiping out your immune cells. Okay. So a follow-up question to that is why are doctors using Tegretol instead of Trileptol? Well, I think Tegretol is one of those things that's, I'm not a neurologist, so I can't really comment. Right. I think that Tegretol is one of those things that we was probably one of the first ones that were used and has really good results. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of patients who tolerate it well, have very little side effects. Mm -hmm. So generally that's kind of the go-to as I understand from my neurologist okay. colleagues. Okay. It doesn't if mean it... that they're married to it and they're stuck to it. If it, they have, again, side effect profiles, there's a lot of other great things, Lyrica and Neurontin. Right. I guess what I've always heard is that with um, Tegretol, you need to do lots of follow-up blood work because it processes through the liver and with Trileptol, that's not as, it's not as big of a problem. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, these drugs are getting better and better and I'm mm -hmm. excited. Hopefully if this paper gets accepted and we're in the second revisions, we've identified a new receptor. We hope even a new class of drugs. Well, that'd be great. Yeah. It'd be so nice. But, um, I think at the end of the day, the, you know, I was saying this on the other call, there's multiple factors for, for drugs, right? And it's not just about pain relief. It's about convenience, you know, mm -hmm. two times a day, one a day, huge difference for patients in terms of convenience. Right. 
um, right. side effect profile. All those things need to be weighed in to try to help the patients. Yeah. And I, I think it's very personal too, like everybody has a preference. Okay, if a patient has comorbid headache conditions like cluster headache or sunct or SUNA, does that change the intervention you would use for the TN piece of this? I think at the end of the day, I always base our therapy on what the patient, what we can do to improve the quality of life for our patients. If someone comes in with migraines and says that sharpshooting pain is only 3% of my life and getting rid of the sharpshooting pain is not going to help me, then I'm generally not going to recommend a trigeminal pr procedure. Whereas if it's on the flip side, let's say 95% of that person's quality of life is ruined by sharp stabbing pain and electrical pain, and they do have migraines, but it's only 5% of the time, then again, the goals need to be clearly clearly laid out, then this may be a person that could benefit from a, um, an intervention. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's highly personal is what I tell my patients and we have discussions. When you they... take cerebral fluid out at the beginning of the mm -hmm. surgery, do you put it back? Right. So yes, in, in other, I, we put, usually they call physiosol or, or saline back in. So mm -hmm. we fill that uh, cavity back up. Okay. And what's the role of cerebral spinal fluid? Well, cerebral spinal fluid, so you make about a liter of it a day. Uh -huh. And you're at any given point in time, you're the tank that's surrounding the brain and your spinal cord is about 150 milliliters. So mm -hmm. there, it, it washes, so basically it circulates five to six times a complete volume, mm -hmm. which means that it clears out a lot of toxic stuff that your brain may make toxic mm -hmm. metabolites, waste products, uh, and it just really keeps the brain nice and clean. There's mm -hmm. suggestions and implications that as that slows down, that could lead to dementia or be a contributor to dementia. Okay. But that is one factor to kind of rinse. I call it a rinsing of the, uh -huh. of the brain. Second is it provides uh, some sort, some secondary levels of shock uh, mm -hmm. in terms of when you bounce, jump around, if you hit your head, just a little bit of I call it a fluid cushion that helps mm -hmm. uh, okay. uh, protect the brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a, a kind of personal question for you now. Mm -hmm. You said earlier that you really like doing MVDs. What, mm -hmm. what attracted you to this very painful, horrible condition? I mean, Aren't there other things that neurosurgeons treat that would be easier day to day? Well, the other part of my practice is brain tumors. So, oh, no. <laughs> um, actually, when I started my career out, I was actually a brain tumor person. And I, I very much was very interested in take, uh, that part of the brain where the trigeminal nerve lives. Mm -hmm. And so I'll take out big tumors. and I spend hours or many, many hours in that part of the brain. And I offered mm -hmm. the microvascular decompression as part of my practice. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those things where in life you, you get to meet um, and learn new things. And the patients uh, were also a, a big part of it. And, for, you know, in the beginning, sometimes with brain tumors, you don't get to say, you don't, it's not a cure or you can't offer a cure. Right. Like vascular right. Compression, you can potentially help people and cure them. And so uh, to me, it, 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 uh, gave me, uh, you know, a sense of, of purpose and, and meaning to be able to help uh, our patients. And I always tell my patients, it's really an honor and privilege to take care of them and, and to be able to do that. The other thing is the microvascular decompression is one of those surgeries where you go in and even though it's invasive, we all take great pride in making it look like we've never been there. Right? Right. To me, that's something very, like you, you hopefully by the end of the surgery have given patients a better life and not taken anything away and they can enjoy everything in life that they want after the surgery. Well, I can personally attest to that. You are not my surgeon, but it, an MVD did change my life. And we are so blessed to have you in our community because you're so genuine and care so much about your patients. So thank you for everything you do. And thank you for being here today. 
Thank you for inviting me and thank you all for your time. Okay.